Ladies and gentlemen, there are 20 minutes for questions. Would you please come to the microphones, uh, say your name and announce your country and speak in a stentorian voice indicating which of the speakers you are addressing to, to whom you are addressing your question. Thank you. Well, let me ask one question then, of, uh, if I may, of uh, Professor McFarlane. Now, basically, you're saying that the bushfires had very little effect upon the ultimate result, much more, effect, much more effective, in a sense, or effectual, with a, was the uh, longer-term adverse situations of childhood. Would you explain, go further, though, and explain again why you say the cognitive schemas that resulted are, could only account for, for a lesser extent than you expected for the depressive symptomatology? Well, I think uh, cognitive theory would predict that depression arises from the negative views that people have about themselves, other people and the world, and their ability to make sense of their life in a positive way. And uh, that it was actually a poor predictor of depressed mood in this population. I mean, I, I, in another presentation, I'll be, be talking about what really appears to be the issue is about repeated stress exposure. Single stress exposures of themselves are obviously um, uh, highly distressing, but it's the repeated uh, uh, events. And particularly if a child has had, uh, or an adult by the age of 20, uh, in the mid-20s, has had more than four events, they really have a very sick, the risk of getting depressed goes up with each subsequent exposure. So um, it, it's really, I think, probably about how those events modify people's reactivities, and that isn't, isn't necessarily re reflected in the way that they actually think about the world. It's actually more uh, reflected in the, the propensity for them to have a high amplitude of distress uh, on further exposure. But if I, if, if I understand I understood some of my discussion with Dr. McFarland that the bushfire families ended up with a higher level of adverse experiences like sexual abuse than would have otherwise been seen and that there was a change in the family dynamics uh, in ways that uh, actually incurred more of these adverse experiences. So I'm tying that a little into my family intervention in terms of his early work on family distress and the need to intervene in these types of estrangements that happen within families uh, over time as a result of actually the experience of a disaster or trauma that then cascades into more adverse experiences and it's the adverse experiences that then become the moderating influence on later life uh, outcome and maybe not the primary actual early experience of the disaster. Well, the question is, what is the timing then of the adverse experience? Do they precede or post-date the bushfire? Well, they po they, they post-dated it. The evidence is that these families, uh, I guess, became more dysfunctional in the extraordinary stress of re trying to rebuild their lives. This was a farming community. Many of them had lost their homes, their livelihoods, uh, and there was a very long, enduring tale of impact. And it seems that some of the boundaries within these families broke down during that period and there was greater infamilial um, sexual abuse. But the real issue happened when some further event came along um, and the child's uh, distress on that occasion uh, was more severe. And I would absolutely pick up what Bob uh, has said because the, the evidence was that the, at the time of the disaster the parents' reactivity predicted the children's symptoms. It also predicted some of these subsequent adversities and you'll see from the characteristics that uh, did predict the negative views. It was, it was uh, um, the, the, the presence of substance abuse uh, and mental distress in the parents which was the really important trauma. So, you know, I think family interventions really have got a great deal to recommend them and I think the uh, presentation which Bob gave is, I think, a very important and interesting one and I'm certainly going to be uh, talking to him more about that. Question? Uh, 
the moment I'm the um, advisor to several of the governments in the United Kingdom um, in our struggle to develop national policies for um, handling disasters, including our response to terrorism. Uh, and my, my con contribution is the psychosocial plan. Um, I wonder if each of the, uh, the speakers would be prepared to offer just one recommendation <coughs> as to what I should include in my advice. Thank you. Dr. Forrest. <coughs> Well, the first recommendation, according to my experience, uh, is to um, include intervention with schools and parents because they are, of course, uh, one of the main influence, uh, have the main influence in children and adolescents. This is according to, my, to the experience I have. Um, my, my recommendation uh, would be to encourage moderation uh, because I think fear is uh, a, an emotion that can be exploited for all sorts of reasons and can have adverse outcomes uh, and I think particularly for children to constantly be placing or creating this view that we live in a dangerous world I think can have all sorts of um, unfortunate and negative effects, such as increasing social prejudice, making stereotypic generalisations, um, and you know, really, if you were going to do something about the, ma the world, making the world a safer place, you'd be doing something about crime and motor vehicle accidents, not about terrorism. Dr. Finus. I have to say that we've written a chapter for the comprehensive textbook on psychiatry and children and terrorism which has a, a little outline of what we see a, a number of the steps that need to be made. I think when you're living under danger, which I think is the way I would put it rather than under terrorism, under the life threat, the living under danger takes uh, uh, the contagion of some of the fears of recurrence that you're talking about are extremely important. Uh, I would say that the issues about prejudice are because when you live under a, uh, something's happened, the brain actually categorizes the, 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 the threat instead of being individual and discriminating and helping individual schools and communities to do that discriminatory work is part of regaining the balance at that time. Um, if I can tell you a quick example, I, I don't know, this is a personal, I, I did a lot of work after 9-11 and I was flying to New York probably within a week of 9-11 and I was on the plane with a, 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 ma a father whose son um, had seen bin Laden on TV and uh, said bad man and he was looking, um, but he, anybody that looked like that was now bad. This is a little three or four year old. This, this father, who had no psychological training, had taken out some of his sports films on hockey players and others that he had watched with his son, and he showed him people that had different features like that or similar, and said, this is not a bad man, and actually helped his son to start to discriminate, just the way I'm talking. It was really quite remarkable within the aftermath of that. Um, so I think that uh, that's why the media, uh, I had said yesterday, the media is difficult because the brain works that if you have a two minute or one minute flash on television, it's a brief reactive exposure. And we now know that brief reactive exposures are fear enhancing. So if we're going to provide information, it has to be in a form that allows for new learning, which is a more extended session, whether it's in the media, on TV, in school classrooms, uh, which is typically not the way it's reproduced in most of our places. And so, in fact, it's a very fear-enhancing system that we live in right now within uh, modern, uh, modern communication. Um, to you. Right. Um, perhaps I could put it in context for the audience that within the UK and the different uh, governments therein, the four of them, um, then there is in increased planning for the aftermath of various adverse events. <clears throat> so that the Civil Emergencies Act of 2004 came into being or was enacted in November 2005 after the London bombing. 
And so we weren't prepared, and there was all sorts of interesting uh, balls ups and so on that will never get put out into the public arena because it would be too embarrassing. Um, the powers that be have listened, believe it or not, to all this mental health mumbo jumbo that goes on. And so now the UK is divided into a number of resilience zones. Resilience is very important. And so you ask, what the hell is a resilience zone? And I ask that of my mental health uh, when I'm talking on this, and very few of them know it. It's actually the police zone. <coughs> and, but they're, they're trying to promote resilience. So that my one bit of advice would be to make sure that in the planning for the aftermath of disaster, that knowledgeable mental health personnel are in there Good. from the word go, not brought in by somebody way, way down the hierarchy after a disaster happens. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, the, I was on holidays, I didn't get involved in it, but the, the recent bad flooding in the UK, the media has been full of all the horrible things that people have experienced and how long it will take to dry out their houses and uh, so on and so forth. And I've not seen anything about the mental health effects. So I went to, the, to IMPACT, which is the Netherlands Kennecentrum for uh, Traumatic Stress, knowledge-based, um, funded by government, and they sent me, by return, uh, I think it was 12 PDF files on uh, work on the mental health effects of flooding, studies of the last 20 years. And this is even before Katrina. And it is terrifying that, yes, you've got 20 to 40 percent of increased mental health problems and long lasting ones, a lot of depression. You also have a doubling of the death rate, according to some studies. None of that has appeared in the, in the, in the news. And I would argue, therefore, get somebody who knows the up-to-date literature and can start doing some practical preparation of communities for dealing with whatever is going to come. Because in the disaster world, the worst thing that we have to recognize is that we're always preparing for the previous disaster and not the next one. I, I, before Leo speaks, I just want to confirm with Dr. Yule, having mental health professionals as part of the planning in there with the decision makers, in the room with decision makers, is probably the best thing that any government or group could do, that, which is rarely happens, but is probably instrumental to making good decisions during that time. Dr. Walmer. I was going to start with your last uh, issue of uh, fighting the last war and not the next one and the recommendation, the first recommendation would be to uh, institutionalize a forecast group that thinks about the next event and not about the last one. Uh, working through cities mayors and executive directors because you will need uh, the support and commitment and it's a long term commitment and allocation of resources. Build the alliance and this is a process, it's not a one step, it will be a process, uh, a lot of resistances in the middle, but it's like a conflict that you have to manage and not resolve. And release control, because it is important that the control remains uh, wherever the people they uh, are and not where the disaster manager is. And think about disaster management as a profession and not as a hobby. It's really a profession. Uh, my last two recommendations would be care for the emergency responders because these are your people and you will need to care for them a lot to build their resilience, to be sensitive to the risk factors they have, to the exposure, to provide training and relief after the intervention. And lastly, work through mediators because you will never have enough mental health professionals to address all the needs you will have to need another group of people. Thank you. Are there any further questions? If not, let us close by acclaim.